Good afternoon and welcome to today's Lake Oswego Public Library virtual event, How to Ace the Interview with Marin Roberts Huntley. Marin Roberts Huntley is an instructor at the U of O, a 20 year business veteran and author of the book Made to Hire, How to Get the Job You Really Want. Her work as a top rated career coach has led her to being featured on live TV news, in Fast Company, and on numerous career podcasts and webinars. She's known for her warm yet direct approach that helps people get hired, make more money, and reach their career goals faster. Thank you so much for being here, everyone, and welcome, Marin Roberts Huntley. Thank you, Alicia. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me on this Saturday afternoon. It is cloudy here where I am in Lake Oswego. So um, I am more than happy to be in here hanging out with you guys. And we actually have a forecast of sunshine for the next week. So we picked the right day to do this, Alicia. All right, so welcome to ACE the Interview. This talk is going to be specifically focused on video interviewing because that is what we're all faced with these days is, is these sort of situations. So my goal is you guys are gonna get a ton out of the next 90 minutes that will really help you put, put into action the things I'm gonna teach you in your next interview. So before I dive in, let me just give you a little bit about my background. I see some familiar faces out there. Hi guys. Um, but those of you who aren't familiar with my story, uh, I'll give you just one slide here on what I'm all about so you'll know where my perspective is coming from. So I've worked in business for about 20 years and have been just really fortunate to have a career working for some big global brands and also I've done a lot of consulting work as well with startups. I um, am the author of this book called Made to Hire, How to Get the Job You Really Want. That is my, my baby, I'm really proud of it. And it allows me to do a lot of talks like this. Um, my passion really is helping people uh, land their dream job. So um, getting to spend time with folks like you is, um, is just so meaningful to me. So thank you for being here. The other thing I do a ton of is normally I do a lot of teaching in a classroom. I'm an instructor in the business school at the University of Oregon in Portland and uh, I've been a Zoom teacher for the past year so I've gotten really comfortable on this technology and love spending time with my students and former students um, so yeah really enjoy teaching. The other thing that's kind of a big part of my life right now that I wanted to share with you guys is I talk a lot to my students and clients about getting uncomfortable putting yourself out there and, and getting comfortable being uncomfortable in order to grow and I'm putting my money where my mouth is myself um, this year. I am competing to hopefully become Mrs. Oregon. Uh, so that's kind of a little bit of a, a personal angle to what's going on with me. Um, yeah, that's a whole other fun challenge, guys. So one of the things, just for a laugh, one of the things I'm learning to do is dance because that's part of the competition. So yeah, if you really, if you really wanna laugh, I'll, I'll probably post that video at some point and you can say you knew me when I was a terrible dancer and hopefully I'll, I'll pull that off on stage. <laughs> so terrifying. All right, that's a little bit about me. Um, but one other thing, you know, this all sounds very serious and polished. Um, this is how I normally am. These are my three kids and that's my husband and we just have a ton of fun. And um, one of the things I really wanna make sure we do here in this talk today is I wanna make sure you guys feel comfortable. I'm here to help you, I have your back. Um, I, I do this because I love giving back and there's no bad question. I want you to get a ton out of this time. So please don't be intimidated. Um, just know that I, I wanna help you. So whatever that looks like for you in terms of questions you might have, it's all fair game, okay? All right, so this is a page in my book that I actually think is, is one of the most important things that I talk about in the work that I do career coaching. There really are five steps, in my opinion, to landing your dream job. And what most people do is they focus on step four. They focus on submitting their application online. And I'll get calls from people and they'll say, Marin, I don't get it. I've applied to 37 jobs and I'm not hearing back. What, what am I missing? And I'll usually say to them, well, what else have you done? And they'll look at me blankly. And, and my point when I ask, what else have you done is because landing your dream job is so much more than just that final step of applying online. There are all these other pieces to the puzzle in terms of building your brand and your network and actually creating tools that will help you in your interview. So 
I want, I would love to talk about that whole journey today. We don't have time for all of that. I am going to focus our discussion on acing the interview. So I'm going to really get very specific about once you've landed that interview, the things that you can do to increase your chances of success. I really believe that there's an art to successful interview, interviewing. What most people do is they show up to an interview and they're just responsive to the questions that come at them. There's not a ton of planning that goes into their preparation for the interview. So I wanna kind of turn that on its head in our, in our session today. These are my goals for us. So we're gonna we're gonna really dive into what you can do before, during, and after your next video interview in order to really increase your chances of getting the offer. So I want you guys to have some, some strong actionable items taking away from this talk, okay? How our time is gonna work is we'll break it up into two sessions with a five minute break in the middle. So you'll have a little bit of a pause in listening to me, me give advice. Um, if you have questions, uh, what we'll do is there'll be um, three times in the talk where I'll just um, take a minute so you can chime in with questions. But also as we're going, if you think of a question and you wanna make sure that we come back to it, just type it in the chat. And um, if Alicia feels like it's something we really should jump on right away, then she'll stop me and we'll, we'll answer it. Otherwise, we'll get to your questions when we have those three question breaks. Sound good? Okay. Okay, so interviewing makes us all nervous, right? I, I get it. You know, I, I, in the past, interviewed for lots of jobs. I know the feeling. I know what it's like to be on the job market and just the anxiety of the looking and the, the, the waiting and the wondering. So how should you think about your next interview? This is kind of one of the, one of the ways in which my advice will diverge from how most people are job searching and interviewing. So I really believe that interviewing is a game. You're probably sitting there going, a game? What do, you, what do you mean? So like I said a minute ago, most people take a very passive sort of position when it comes to interviewing. They're asked a question, they think of what comes to mind, and that's the answer that they say. That's actually not the best way to interview. Interviewing is actually an art. There's a strategy to it. And I wanna teach you how to play that game because if you're going to put in all this time building a great resume and sending out all these applications and searching and searching for jobs, then let's actually really increase your chances of getting the offer after your next interview. So we're gonna go through these three sections in my presentation, the before, the during, and the after. And I've got uh, some slides in each section. All right, so before your next interview, and guys, this one is kind of the meatiest uh, of, um, of the talk. And um, you guys are welcome to take notes as we go, or Alicia, I'm also happy to share my deck if you have a way to um, share it with the group afterwards, I'm, I'm certainly happy to do that. Okay, so I've got a, probably a slide or two on each of these topics, but here's what we'll talk about before the interview, because a lot of people, they really just think about what, what they do during the interview. I want you thinking about all this work that you can do beforehand that's going to help set you up for success. So we'll go over what sort of research to do. We'll talk a little bit about your story, your portfolio, the examples you're gonna use in the interview, some of the questions that you'll likely be asked. What do I mean by endorsements? What's that all about? The questions that you actually are gonna ask the interviewer. We'll talk a little bit about um, putting together your look for the interview, and then logistics. So let's dive into each of these. Okay, so doing your research is a huge part of truly preparing for your next interview. So what are the most important things here? So the first one is the people. So you really want to understand who is interviewing you. So typically it's going to be somebody from HR who's going to set up the interview. And if they don't tell you who's actually interviewing you, the name of the person, make sure you get that from them. You don't wanna go into an interview blind. How does it help you if you actually know who the person is? Well, you can go on LinkedIn and check them out and figure out their background, right? And look at the career journey that they've had. Because one of the things that ideally you're doing in your next interview is you're actually finding some points of connection and, and intersection with that person interviewing you. So imagine if you find out that the person interviewing you went to the same college as you, 
or imagine if you find out that you have connections in common with them. And we'll talk about maybe using those in a minute. It's very different, right? Even just your comfort and confidence going into that interview, if you kind of in your mind have an idea of what's that interviewer's story in terms of their background, that's going to make you feel a lot more at ease rather than walking into a room and having no idea the point of view that the person interviewing you is coming from. So definitely do your research and make sure you know, is it is it a one person interview or is it going to be a panel of people and, and figure out as much as you can from LinkedIn about those, those people's stories who are going to be interviewing you. And then the other big piece in terms of your research is going to be really diving into the company, right? And truly understanding what the company is all about. Think about uh, first, I would say, what's on their website? How are they communicating about themselves in terms of their mission, their values, their products or services, their history, their leadership team? I would spend a good chunk of time on the company's website before you go into the interview. They're giving you a whole bunch of information right on the site about how they see the how they see their business, how they see their their leadership team, you know, the the industry that they play in, right? They're giving you so much. So spend some time um, doing looking looking through that. One of the things I will often ask when I interview people is, um, you know, so what do you think about our website? Right? And if you haven't spent any time on the company's website, that's um, you know, that's a real miss. Other thing to think about when you're researching the company is what's happening with them lately? What sort of news uh, or press have they been getting? If it's positive press, that definitely would be something that you might want to mention in the interview, right? Because that shows that you're up to date on what's happening with the company. If it's negative press, that's something you want to be aware of. And I, I wouldn't mention that in the interview, but just to have that awareness uh, would be a good Okay, so research is a big part of your preparation. And also it'll just make you feel more confident, right? Having really dove into what they're all about, the people and the business. All right, guys, this one is huge. Preparing your story uh, for your next interview. Oh my gosh, I can't stress this enough. So why is this so important? Well, there's one question I can guarantee you that every single interview has. And that question is at the beginning and it's something along the lines of, so tell me about yourself or, so what's your story, right? It all, they all start the same way. And that is your opportunity to share with the interviewer what you're all about. And this sadly guys is when most interviews end. What do I mean by that? Well, that's usually when most interviewers start to check out because the interviewee is just not telling their story in a compelling way. And the interviewer already knows within those first few minutes, if this person has a good shot at getting the job or not. The rest of the interview becomes a validation of that gut feeling that they had in those first few minutes. So this skill of telling your own story well, I cannot stress to you how important it is to work on this. So some of the things that I want you to think about when, when you work on this. So you want to have your story, and it's funny, right? Because there's nothing you know more about than yourself, but we get really good talking about other people and other things like companies we've worked for or schools we've gone to, but we get really uncomfortable when we're asked to talk about ourselves and we got to get over this, right? We really just, we need to be able to speak about ourselves in a concise and confident way. So how can we do that? So think about your story as each of us has probably 20 or 30 things that we could weave in as we tell a story about our background. But what you wanna do is you wanna choose the points of your story that are going to best align you with that job that you're interviewing for. So right now, if we were in a, if we were in a, a panel interview and you guys were interviewing me to be um, your career coach, I would tell my story in a very different way than if you guys were interviewing me to be um, you know, a marketing VP, right? And think about that with the types of jobs that you're applying for. If you're interviewing to work for, let's say Target, or if you're interviewing to work for Intel, those companies are very different, right? And how can you tweak your story in order to best align it with those companies and, and best align your experience with the job that you're interviewing for? 
So I like to think about your story as a menu. And maybe what you want to do is get out a piece of paper and jot down some keywords that are, that are on your menu, right? So it could be town you grew up in. It could be um, what you studied in school. It could be um, what industry you've worked in. It could be um, any um, you know, reputable companies you've worked for. It could be areas where you have special expertise. It could be languages that you speak. It could be countries that you've traveled to. It could be um, technical skills that you have, right? Think about this menu all these things that you could weave together in a story and then as you look at a job description that are preparing for your interview figure out how you're going to weave it together in the way that is going to best connect you with that job it's all still going to be you but you're going to amplify different parts of your story and my second point there know your audience right so if you've done your research you're going to know what parts of your story are going to be more meaningful to your audience. So if you know the person interviewing you has traveled extensively in Europe and Asia, and if that's part of your story too, you're gonna to wanna to share that with that interviewer, right? Versus if you know that the person interviewing you has only worked in graphic design his or her whole career, if you have any experience in graphic design, you're gonna to wanna to weave that in, right? So just really knowing your audience is, is really important. And then the third bullet there, guys, this one is so important. So when I work with people on their stories, one of the things that most people do, um, and it's just human nature, I guess, is we devalue ourselves or our experience. So what does that look like? What do I mean? So when people are telling their story, they'll say things like, you know, I finished college and honestly, I just, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. So I decided to go and teach English in Korea. Or they'll say things like, yeah, it's been a really tough year. Um, I've actually been, I was actually laid off about a year ago uh, and I've been looking for work ever since and it's been rough. So those are examples of devaluing yourself. Those things may be true and that's great, but we're not going to share those things on the first date, so to speak, right? If an interviewer really drilled down and, and really wanted to get into something specific that would be a little bit more vulnerable in terms of your experience, fine, we can talk about that. But when you're the one who gets to put together the story in a way that's going to benefit you the most, I want you to think about how can you tell it in a way that is authentic to you, but also really aligns with what they're looking for, for the person they're hiring. And another key point, guys, that fourth bullet point is don't memorize it. So one of the worst things that people do is they, they get their computer out and they start typing out their story and they've got this paragraph and then they start reading the story. And, and in an interview, we're going to know as the interviewer that you're, re that you're reading and it just doesn't seem natural. And when you're talking about yourself, that's going to be weird, right? <laughs> if, if it seems like you're reading a story about yourself. So how do you make it seem natural? What I suggest is when we think about that menu idea, right, of all the things that you could add to your story, as you're preparing, pick, pick the, you know, let's say it's the five to 10 keywords that are going to cue you along your story. And and in your mind, you know that you're going to start with, you know, I, I was born in England, raised in Vancouver, did my, did my, you know, college studies at, right? You know, they're going to be these, these words that are going to take you along your journey, but you're not going to write out a paragraph because frankly, if it's you that you're talking about, it's going to be a lot more natural if you just flow through it. The other great thing about that is you're not going to get stumped when you forget a word because we've all been in situations where, you know, we've had to speak in public and we memorized it and we forget a word and then it's obvious that we've forgotten the word and that's just awkward, especially if you're, if you're talking about yourself, right? And the other thing um, that I suggest guys on here is have a couple different lengths for how you can tell your story. So if the interview is, is kind of a short interview, like a 20 minute phone screening and the interviewer starts off and they say, you know, Alicia, tell me about yourself. I would plan on it being kind of a more concise story, maybe a, a minute, right? Versus if the interviewer says, you know, hey, Alicia, can you, you know, take, take a few minutes and really give us a good idea of, of your story? You know, maybe there you want to go on for three or four minutes. 
if you're going on past you know five minutes i'd say you've lost them it's going to be boring past that point so just be mindful of um not rambling on okay and we're going to come back to story um in, in a few minutes okay we're still planning right we still are before the interview uh, and getting ready for this interview. So guys, this is one of, I would say, um, in the work I've done for the past decade as a career coach, this is one of the pieces of my kind of secret sauce that I, I'm excited to share with you today. So 99% of people, when they go into an interview, they're going with a resume and just a resume. And they're kind of like everybody else. All they do is have a resume. And sometimes, you know, if it's a, in the old days when we showed up in person for interviews, they would hand the resume over. Um, and, and now, you know, people are just assuming that the interviewer has that resume. And that's it. And they just show up. That's pretty mediocre, right? So I'm a big believer that how you show up, how you represent yourself in the, inter in the interview is indicative of how you're going to conduct yourself in the job. So if you're kind of just mediocre and, and show up and that's, that's it, I'm not thinking that you're going to blow their socks off if they hire you. Versus if you really bring it, you are super prepared and actually put together some documents beyond a resume, you're going to stand out. Okay, so that's what this slide is all about. This slide is all about what I call your portfolio. A lot of people will look at me sideways and say, but I'm not a designer, Marin. I don't have a, I don't have a portfolio of all my design work. That's not, that's not what I'm talking about here. So I'm talking about documents that you can create. You don't have to have any design skills to create these. I'm talking about documents beyond a resume that you can put together as a PDF and email it to the person interviewing you. So imagine the night before your interview, if you have this PDF, and we'll talk about what you can put in it, you have this PDF, and let's say it's five or six pages, you don't want it to be crazy long, because then you'll freak them out if you send them this 20 page PDF, right? Let's say it's five or six pages, and you send it to the person interviewing you the night before the interview, and you say, you know, Steve, I'm really looking forward to our conversation tomorrow, just put together a, a quick portfolio for you, I'm going to reference this when we when we chat tomorrow. So there's that applicant or candidate. And then there's the one who just shows up to the Zoom call. Totally different caliber of human there, right? Coming at this interview, okay? So let's look at some of the things that you can, that you can create. So here's an example on the right side of my screen of just a cover page that you could put on this, um, this portfolio that you make, right? So what do we have here? So the guy who was applying for the position, his name's Zach Holland. So he's got his name below his name. He's put the job that he's applying for, project manager, and then he's personalized it. He's, he's written on here, application packet. That's what he's calling this, or you could call it portfolio. Application packet prepared for, and the person interviewing him, her name was Emily Davis. And he was interviewing at, at, a, um, at an outdoor brand called Yakima. They make racks and outdoor kind of gear and so he kind of went a step further and he, he put their logo, which he got from Google, and he puts, they use this kind of forest visual. He took that from their website and he stuck it on, on here. He did this in a Word document, right? And he converted it to a PDF. So that is a start, right? So it's somebody who's going to send somebody a, a, a PDF over email, and this is the starting page for it. Hmm, I'm kind of paying attention now, right? So that'd be the first page. I'd say the second page would be your resume, which, you know, we've all got one of those, right? And then the next page is one of my favorite, most sneaky, clever, incredible things. I call it a suitability map, okay? Um, I've blown this up um, on the screen here, so don't worry about being able to read this, okay? Just go with me on the journey of what this thing is. So we've all read lots of job descriptions. And in job descriptions, they list out the 10 or 12 things that they're looking for, that they're, they're hiring for. So the idea with this one pager is on the left side, you take from that job description, the things they say they want. And on the right side, you directly link what they say they want to the experience that you have. Kind of an amazing sell sheet, right? So what do you do if, let's say they've got 10 things listed that they're looking for and you only really have eight of them. Well, then you put eight on here. You don't have to put all 10, right? This is just a quick hit for the interviewer. They may look at it during the interview. They may refer back to it afterwards, but this is when they're saying to themselves, hmm, you know, how, how good of a match is Zach for that job? 
I mean, Zach's giving it to you right here. I mean, Zach clearly wants it, right? And he's telling, he's telling you, you said you want this, here's how I give it to you. You said you want that, here's how I give it to you. Again, totally different caliber of candidate. Alicia? Yeah, we did have a question come through um, in regard to this. Uh, would you recommend creating a portfolio like this for a 30 minute panel interview, even if you're told not to prepare anything? Definitely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. So again, he's put some subtle branding on here. He's called it, he's called it a suitability chart or suitability map, you know, call it whatever you like, um, as long as it makes sense. Okay, so that's, that's an, that is a great tool, you guys. Another tool that I love and I suggest people do is the, the third bullet point there, a 30, 60, 90 day plan. So again, I'm gonna show you a visual, but don't get hung up on not being able to read the words. Just go with me on kind of what this thing is. So. This is a one pager where you're basically showing them, if you hire me, here's how I would approach the role in the first month, the second month, and the third month, right? That's on another level than most people who just show up with their resume. And you may be saying, well, how do I know how I'm gonna approach the role? Again, you're gonna have to you know, think through this, but even the example I've given you here gives you a, a template to think from, right? So. Every job the first month is about onboarding, learning what they hired you to do, right? And setting some goals and meeting the team. Every job, the second month really is about kind of immersing yourself more in what you were hired to do. And the third month is more about actually leading and doing what they hired you to do. So you can even, you know, kind of read through what I've got on this slide and I, you would get some inspiration, even if what you do is totally different than what this example, uh, what this person does. So again, 30, 60, 90 day plan, really, really good uh, way to show an interviewer that you want this job and you're really qualified to do it. And then the last uh, two things here that I wanna talk about, I have um, a visual for the next one. So work samples. So what do I mean? What do I mean by that? So we've all been in interviews and we get asked to tell a story, right? About, you know, the work that we did at Nike or the work that we did at Apple or wherever, right? We've all been asked to tell stories about past experience. Well, imagine if when you're telling that story, there's actually a visual that goes along with the story. That would be a much stronger way to tell that story. So here's an example. And again, don't worry about the words on the page here. And this person does happen to have design skills. So they did kind of a fancy job at it. But, um, you know, this person is talking about, this is a footwear developer and she's talking about a project that she worked on in footwear. So what she's done at the top is she's put her name. She's talked about what the project is, right? So this is the 10 collection. She's given an overview of what, the, what she was doing on the project. And then she's talked about some of the details of the project. And then at the bottom, the results. One of the keys to doing a great work sample is try to make it visual, right? So any examples that you could put on this one pager that would help the interviewer actually see and really get a feel for what you did, that's where the magic happens with this, you know? And then keeping the text simple, right? So what was it? What were you responsible for and what happened? That's all you really need, okay? So I like to suggest one or two um, work samples in a portfolio, um, you know, and you can create these and you can create all of these tools and just tweak them a little bit based on uh, who you're interviewing with. But if you follow this formula, guys, of creating this portfolio, and if you do the things that I talk about in this talk, you're not going to be interviewing for long. It's just you're going to set yourself up on a totally different trajectory than most people who are interviewing. So just think about that, right? Because I know you're probably sitting there going, oh, this sounds like a lot of work putting together these documents, right? But the point that you know I made at the beginning of this talk is if you're going to go through this whole process of searching for jobs, and hopefully getting interviews, then let's just get, let's get the offer already, right? And if you wanna get the offer, you gotta stand out. So I'm trying to show you how you can stand out. And then the last thing on here that could be great uh, to have in your portfolio is a letter of recommendation. So how do you get a great letter of recommendation? You write it yourself. So what, what do I mean? So let's say that I used to work for Alicia and 
you know, I, I'm on the job hunt and I know that, you know, Alicia was a great manager and I know she would write me a great letter of recommendation, but I know Alicia's really busy, right? So here's the best way to handle that situation. So I send Alicia, Alicia an email and I say, Alicia, just wanted to update you on where I'm at, you know, um, just really kind of deep in the job search. And one of the things that I'd love to put in, um, in my application is a letter of recommendation. I know you're super busy. Um, would that be something you would be comfortable helping me with? I would be more than happy to write a draft of it that you could then edit. So why is that a win, guys? Well, that's a win for a few, re a few reasons. Alicia doesn't have time to write a letter of recommendation for me, right? Alicia do also doesn't really know the sort of things that I'm hoping that she amplifies in that letter. And by giving her a draft, she can then make it her own, right? But I'm saving her probably 30 minutes that she didn't have and could definitely use for something else, right? So don't be presumptive. And when you, know, when you send that first email, don't send the draft, that's too much. Just send, you know, send a short note asking if they'd be willing um, to write a letter. And if it would be easier, you'd, you'd be happy to write a draft that they could edit, right? I guarantee you they'll write back and they'll be like, I'd be happy to do that. Boy, that would be awesome. I get asked um, a lot of people to write letters for them. And I don't, there's no way I don't have time to write the letter, but I'm happy to edit the letter and sign it, right? So, um, so think about that. And then also think about who you're asking um, to write a letter of recommendation for you. Ideally, you're writing, you're getting one written that you can use across a few different, um, applications, right? Um, so, you know, think about impact, right? Who are some of the heavier hitters in your network, no matter um, kind of what the company is that you're, you're applying to, them seeing that you have a letter from somebody in that senior of a position or somebody who works for that company, that can have an impact for sure. That was a lot. Okay, <laughs> hopefully that's helpful, you guys. I'm gonna move on to the next slide, but we are gonna come back. Um, we're gonna come back to the portfolio when we get to the during the interview section and how do you actually kind of bring this thing to life um, now that we're talking about putting these pieces together. All right, so we're still planning. I know it feels like we're doing a lot of planning, but I guarantee you, if you do this planning, it's going to be worth it. Okay, so plan the examples you're gonna use. So I said at the beginning of this talk, that I really view interviewing as a game, right? And it's about placing your strongest stories against the questions that you're asked. So usually what people do is they get asked a question and they just say what comes to mind. That's not the best way to interview. The best way to interview is to actually plan in advance the stories that you're going to tell that are gonna best match you with that job. So each of us, when we think through our work experience, we have some strong examples that we can pull from, probably more than we ever are gonna to need to use. What I want you to think about when you look at that next job description and you're getting ready to interview is which of those stories from your resume are going to really tell an, a robust picture of why you're so qualified for that job, right? And what I like to suggest people do is when they're actually interviewing, have a piece of paper in front of you, have those five to seven keywords that are gonna reference you, kind of cue you to those stories. And at the end of the interview, you'll be able to look at that piece of paper. And if you've kind of crossed off, you know, most of them, you've probably done really well in that interview. Because the worst feeling, and I'm sure we've all had it, is when you walk out of or end an interview and you go, shoot, I didn't tell them about this or that, right? Because that was one of your strongest stories that connected you so well with that job. We've all had that feeling, right? And that's why I say, actually really plan the examples you're going to use. Be very intentional about what you want to, what you want to get across. And this takes some time for you to actually do this pre-work, right? Before the interview, really think about what you want to get across. We'll talk more in a minute about during the interview and how, how to, more about how to do this in the interview. Okay, so just a reminder on kind of where we're at. So we've gone through those first four topics on before the interview. We're gonna go through the next five. And then after we get through these five, we'll do questions and we'll take a little break. Okay, so you're still planning, right? So here are some of the questions that I suggest you really think about. In my book, um, I've got a whole bunch of these questions, but I, I wanna just kind of workshop with you for a minute what I think are some of the more common questions. 
This one is obvious, guys, right? So what do you know about our company? This one freaks people out sometimes if they didn't do their research, right? If they didn't spend time really diving into the company. You've got to be really confident and comfortable talking about the company, right? And here, it also is great to think about, you know, why is this company a good fit for you? Um, you know, what are some of the things that you can say um, that align you with this company, which really connects with my second question, you know, why does this position interest you? So here, with both of these questions, you want to show, a no you want to show knowledge of the company, and you want to show alignment with what the company does, whether it's, you know, aligning with their values, aligning with their corporate mission, right, aligning with, um, you know, the sort of consumer who they serve, right? Um, so really, you know, think about how are you going to match who you are and what you're passionate about with them and what they're passionate about. That's when you're going to have the interviewer starting to nod, you know, their head during the interview, uh, or at least in their mind nodding their head. This question, uh, you know, it, it always rears its head in some form or another. What's one of your weaknesses, right? They find sneaky ways to ask this, but this is really what they're getting at. They always ask something like this. What's one of your weaknesses? So how do you handle this question? We all hate this question. So what do you do with it? So you, you definitely don't say, I don't have any, because that's that just, you're going to be annoying, right? And that's, nobody's perfect. Let's be honest, right? So what, what could you talk about? So you don't want to talk about a weakness that is directly connected to the job. So think, and you can plan this in advance, right? We're still planning here. So think about something that you genuinely are working on that, you know, it, it is a weakness, but it will not affect your ability to do this job, right? So perhaps for me, so, I, you know, I, I teach marketing, right? Um, and if I was in a marketing interview and I was asked this question, I could say something like, you know, I spend a ton of time looking at websites and giving feedback on websites. That's a huge part of my work. I'm so glad that I'm not the one having to do the coding and all the back end work on websites. So do you know what I'm saying? It, it's a genuine weakness, but it's not something I would have to do in the job, right? So find something that is actually, true, um, but isn't going to hurt your chances. That's what I would say here. And, and just, you know, kind of steer away from, from the, the silly ones like, I take on too much or, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm known to work the longest hours. You know, we're not, nobody wants to work with a martyr, right? So this is kind of one of the other things that you want to try to weave through that your interview is, and it starts with your story, is, is to be your genuine self and, and to be likable because, if you've gotten to the interview, the odds are you're qualified to do the job. They're trying to figure out if they want to work with you because we all know how much time we spend with our coworkers, right? Okay, this is a good question. And this comes up in different forms, right? So, you know, where do you see yourself in five years or what does the future look like for your career, right? Here, what they're trying to figure out here is, do you see longevity in this company? That's important, right? So if you talk about your dreams of starting your own business, <laughs> that's not a good thing to share with them. And even if that is your dream, five years from now, 10 years from now, don't share that with them. Keep that to yourself, okay? What they wanna hear is that, you know, you're particularly interested in, you know, how quickly it seems like the company's growing and, you know, you, you love the, the opportunity that's in front of you with this role, but you could also really see yourself moving up within, within the organization something like that, right? They need to see that you're thinking longer term and that this could be a fit for you. Oh, this one. Okay, so what are your salary expectations? This always comes up somehow, some way. Um, more and more, this is happening with um, the screening, that first screening call. Um, recruiters are asking this question and they're just kind of getting it out of the way, right? And they're, they're just coming right out and they're saying, you know, Alicia, so, you know, what are you looking to make? And how do you handle that? Okay, so a little bit, a few things here. So the first thing, Alicia, what are you looking to make? So if I'm Alicia, I would respond to that by saying, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm actually really interested in what the, the hiring range is for the position. So I would first respond with a question. What, what's the hiring range for the position? And I'd see if it's a more junior recruiter, they may actually give it to you. Um, odds are they won't give it to you. They'll come back and they'll push you again and they'll say, oh, you know, I'm not able to share that with you. I, you know, I, I really, I do actually need to find out, you know, what are your salary expectations, right? So odds are they're going to push you on that. And here is um, 
here's where research comes in, okay? And probably on my research slide, I should have put one other point there, which is research yourself, right? By that, I mean, research your market value, research what this job that you're applying for should pay. So you can go to sites like payscale.com um, or glassdoor.com and you can type in any job in pretty much any city and it'll tell you what that job should pay. So that's part of your research. And then the other thing to think about is what were you making in your most recent position? So those are kind of, those nuggets should be in your mind affecting your salary expectations. So a lot of people when asked this question, they'll respond by giving a range. What does that do? Well, that tells the interviewer that you're willing to take the bottom of the range. And you know what? Maybe even a little bit below the bottom. Don't give a range. Ranges shoot you in the foot, right? So tell them a number and, and in your mind, justify that number, right? You don't have to give them the justification, but if they ask for it, you know that positions at this level in this market are typically paying this. You know that in your last role, you were making this, right? So what's your salary expectation? Give them an actual number, right? And, and have justification for that number. Why are you the best person for this position? Sometimes you get a really direct kind of, um, kind of tough interviewer who just wants to play ball and they just want, you know, they want you to sell yourself a little bit to them. Well, imagine if you've made that suitability map, right? Talk about a time to pull that out and, and or, in, you know, reference it and give them a couple of, you know, maybe two or three of the most important things from the job description that it looks like they're looking for. Don't be shy about actually telling them why you're the best person for the job, you know, actually show that confidence and that hunger that you want it. Okay, we're getting obviously more and more questions about working from home. So you probably are getting some questions like this one. This here's an example. So how do you minimize distractions when working from home, right? This is a big deal. You know, Alicia and I were laughing before the call started about, you know, I needed to go make sure my three kids didn't come, <laughs> didn't come and join the call. And she kind of said the same thing. Um, okay, so how do you handle this question? So if I would say, if you're somebody who actually does naturally have a really quiet work from home environment, tell them that, right? So, you know, I, I'm actually single, I, I live by myself. And, and so I, I completely control my environment. If that's your truth, I would definitely share that, okay? If that's not your truth, if you're like me or Alicia and there's lots going on at your house, I wouldn't share that there's lots going on at your house. What I would say is, Boy, you know, this year is sure being a transition for everyone. And I've actually created a really great work from home environment. You know, I have a, I have a quiet space where I have set working hours. And, um, you know, it's, it's actually been incredibly productive the past year. Whatever your version of that is, where you can assure them that there's a, you know, a quiet, uninterrupted space and that, you know, you, um, you, have, <laughs> you have kind of set times that you're working, right? It's not this kind of, yeah. I'll check my email every so often, may or may not go and actually sit at my desk, right? You want to instill some confidence in them that although things are more flexible working from home, you've got this, like you've mastered how to do this here in the past year, okay? Oh, then um, this question, you know, this can be tricky, right? So let's say they ask you, let's thinking back to that job description, let's say they ask you, do you have experience doing X? And by X, they're asking about the one thing <laughs> on the job description that you don't have and you were worried that they were gonna ask you about. We've probably all had that happen. And you're like, no, not, you know, not that. Um, how do you handle that when they come right for you? It's like stabbing you in the heart, right? Because the interview was going so well up until this point. <laughs> um, so how do you handle that? You don't say no, like no. If you just come right out and say no, the conversation's over, right? Instead, I would suggest you say, I have experience doing, and then talk about anything closely connected. I'm, this is a little bit of a positive spin, right? So do you have experience building websites? You know, I actually have a ton of experience working with designers and actually you know, coming up with the concept for what the site looks like. Something I'm super passionate about, yada, yada, yada. They may come at you again and they may drill down further. If they keep drilling, you will have to share, no, I haven't specifically done that. But at least on the first pass, 
my advice is to talk about related experience. Anything you have that's at all connected to what they're looking for, okay? Because you can learn. The things that you're missing, if you're coming in there with eight of the 10 skills that they're looking for, you can learn the other one, you know? And if you get to a point in the interview where they're drilling you on that one thing and, and you know, you do, and they do say, I just really need to know, have you done it? And you say, you know, I haven't done it, but, you know, I've, I've been doing some reading lately on, on, you know, a short course that I could do, or, you know, I, I've heard that your company does have some great training on that, right? So if you're going to say no, I want you to combine that with something productive or positive that you're going to do to immediately balance that no, okay? And then um, one other question on here, kind of, I threw this in as the wacky question, right? So you get some creative interviewers and they just throw you a curveball like this, you know, so Alicia, you know, tell me, how many tennis balls fit in a pool? Or how many pudding cups fit in a minivan? <laughs> so they don't care what the answer is, guys. The point of these wacky questions is they wanna see how your brain thinks, right? And they wanna know that you're not gonna get stressed when there isn't perfect information. So how can you handle a question like this? Just take them through a process in your brain. So if this was the question, how many tennis balls fit in a pool? You, you know, I would break it down and I'd say, you know, gosh, I have no idea, but I think this is how I would figure it out. Um, you know, a, a pool is maybe 500 gallons of water, you know, and I'm thinking about one of those gallon milk jugs that's sitting in my fridge right now, and I could probably fit five tennis balls in it, you know, if I do the math, blah, 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 right? There's, the answer to this doesn't matter. They just want to see, A, how your brain works, and B, if this is going to stress you out, okay? And then the other thing, as you, um, as you practice interview questions, I'm a huge fan of actually doing a mock interview. You know, um, actually put yourself in kind of a stressful situation with somebody else over the over a video and um, or over the phone. You know, where you're getting fired questions at you, and they take some notes and they give you some feedback afterwards because it's like interviews are tough and stressful. You know, so actually getting some confidence after of being in that situation is is a really good idea. Okay, where are we headed now? I we've got a couple more slides um, before we take, um, take questions and a break. Okay, so I mentioned this earlier, endorsements. So what do I mean by that? So when we think back to that slide that I showed you at the beginning, those five steps to landing your dream job, your network is a huge part of your ability to get or not get your next job. People think that they're these solo soldiers out there, like these warriors out there looking for work and boy, it's tough. It is tough, but the person getting hired, I guarantee you is going to have somebody supporting them or endorsing them and that leads to them getting hired. So let's think about how that could look. So if you have any contacts inside the company that you're interviewing at, absolutely. Let them know you're interviewing and ask them if they would be willing to send a quick note to the interviewer on your behalf. That goes a long, long way. Let's say you don't have any contacts within the company and, you know, this is, um, it's, you know, it's all new, right? There's no, there's nothing familiar there. Think about the people in your network, any of the heavier hitters who you have in your network who, if they sent a note on your behalf recommending you to the hiring manager, that could have an impact, right? They don't actually have to have a relationship. If it's somebody who has an impressive background and they send a, a quick email to the hiring manager just supporting your, applicant, your uh, application, uh, that can go a long way too because people who end up getting hired, more often than not, they have people sending notes, whether they're internal or external, people sending notes on their behalf. It's a confidence builder for the hiring manager, right? If they've heard about you from other people, that helps them feel good about their decision. Okay, so next one here is prepare your questions, right? So we talked about all these questions that they're probably gonna ask you. What about you at the end? You get the chance to, answer, to ask at least a question or two, right? So here's some um, guidance on how I would handle that. I would probably have one or two questions ready about the role. If at the end they say, do you have any questions about the job? And you say, no, uh, it seems kind of uninterested, right? So 
you can go into the interview with a few questions that you probably already had just looking at the job description and, and as you prepare, but also some may just organically come to you uh, during the interview. So just plan to have one or two that's going to show an appropriate level of interest in the role. My absolute favorite question of all time to ask is the second bullet point there. What's the number one thing you're looking for in, in who you hire? So if you ask the interviewer that question, they get the chance to tell you truly, you know, what is, you know, what's that, that, that number one, what's that kind of gold mine that they're looking for. Hopefully you have really done a good job at conveying that, that you have that skill. If you haven't done a good job at conveying that you have that skill, now's a really great time <laughs> to share with them that, oh gosh, you know, I actually, I, I totally forgot to mention the fact that, you know, I've actually done advanced training in, in Excel or whatever it may be, right? So uh, that question is incredibly important. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute too. Um, and then the last question that's always, good, that's always good to ask is, you know, what does timing look like for them hiring the position? That'll help manage your expectations. And then um, planning your look. So it's weird, right? This whole, you know, we see this box and there's a person in it and we see their hair and their shirt and that's it. It's just, it's different, right? So what are some of the things to think about with video interviewing and, and how to plan your look? Um, you know, I would say it's a good time if you've got a really dated hairstyle or, um, you know, just haven't gone to the hairdresser for a really long time. A video interview is a great reason to get an updated, you know, haircut or hair color uh, because our hair is kind of a big deal in video interviews. Um, I would say in terms of what you're wearing, I would do some digging online to understand the, the corporate culture, right? What do people normally wear at, you know, insert company name, right? What do they normally wear there? And for your video interview, I would step it up one notch from um, what the normal culture is there. So, you know, I wouldn't, I, I'd say, I don't think a t-shirt's gonna be appropriate in any um, interview situation. Even if you're interviewing at somewhere super casual, let's say like a surf company, you're probably gonna wanna take it up to like a polo, let's say, you know, if you're interviewing at a surf company. So just kind of, you know, really going for one notch above what typical attire would be in the company would be my guide. And then I would avoid for an interview, I would avoid patterns and also avoid white. Those two don't do so well on video. They're distracting. Um, white really washes you out and patterns just look busy versus like a solid color, kind of like I've got a navy blue on here. Um, solid colors, solid dark colors look particularly good on video. It's just, it's just how it is. Um, use an iron. <laughs> Uh, you know, you can see really wrinkled, um, kind of disheveled clothes on Zoom. You can see it, right? So um, just those little details do matter. Um, if you're a woman and you are um, somebody who does wear makeup in, in your day-to-day -day life or when you get dressed up, um, I would consider wearing makeup. Um, a little bit of lipstick, right, can go a long way and just brightening up your face on a video call. So use it to your advantage. Just bring some energy to your face. And then the other thing I would definitely do as you plan your look is test, test your room, test the lighting in your room um, that you're going to be interviewing. Um, and realize that uh, even on your, your computer screen, you can probably adjust. So watch this, right? Do I look, do I look dark now to you? Do I look darker? No? Okay. Um, well, you, whether your computer will impact the lighting or your room lighting, definitely test how how well lit you're going to be, because um, that'll, that'll certainly impact um, how you look on screen. And then the last, um, last piece here on before the interview, see, we're still planning. It's crazy, right? We haven't even gotten to the interview, but I promise the next, the last few sections aren't as long as this one. Okay, so uh, be clear on logistics, right? So make sure you're really confident on, you know, who's interviewing you, when it is, where it is, you know, all those details, if it does happen to be in person, realize that a lot of a lot of companies, especially the big ones, have multiple buildings. It's super confusing. So if you are doing an in-person interview, I would scout it out the day before so you feel really confident uh, where you're going. If you're doing a virtual interview, definitely test the technology. Um, you know, don't assume that the video interview is going to be on Zoom, right? Um, you know, sometimes I get thrown these other types of software from people I have calls with and 
you know, I don't have the up-to-date version or whatever, right? Um, if that's an interview and you're showing up late because of a software problem, not good, right? So, so test all of that. Okay, so this is, um, these are the topics. Gosh, there were nine of them, I think. That was a lot. Hopefully your brains aren't overflowing. Um, hopefully that was helpful. Um, I was gonna take questions and then uh, take a five minute break before we talk about some advice specific to during the actual interview and then after the interview. What do you think, Alicia? Sounds great. And we do have a question. Um, what type of virtual background is appropriate for an interview? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you don't wanna use your um, room environment that you're in, that's totally fine. I would just say, keep it simple. Um, keep it simple and professional. So, you know, I would steer away from, um, you know, overly busy, um, e even the like kind of um, fun and gimmicky things like the tropical island, you know, I'd steer away from those things because it's just gonna be distracting and go for, you know, something solid, um, like a solid color so that you're the focus, not, um, not what's happening behind your head. Great, we don't have any other questions at the moment. Does anyone else have a question? All right, well, let's do this. Let's take a five minute break, get your coffee, your water, your restroom break, whatever you need to do. And we'll meet back here at um, 4.02. All right, see you guys in a few. Well, Mary, and I have another question that just came in. Yeah. Uh, what are some good interview questions to ask if I would like to work at a gym? Oh yeah, like a fitness center gym? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I would say, um, I would wanna ask questions understanding the gym goers, right? So, you know, what are their busiest times? Um, um, you know, what areas of the gym are the most highly used? Um, you know, how do they see um, staff in the gym um, best supporting the clientele? What, you know, what can the staff do to best support the clientele? Uh, you know, for me, working in a gym, a lot of it is going to be about servicing the, the clients, right? And so what's the best way to do that? Um, that's why I was asking about the busiest areas, the most used equipment, what's the best way to, you know, to help the clients. So those are sort of questions that come to mind for me. Hopefully those are helpful. All right, let's dive in here, guys, um, during the interview. So we've done all this preparation work and now we're in the actual interview and you're gonna see that the preparation that we just did is, is gonna, we're gonna build on that here. So we're gonna kind of layer on um, the work we just did. Okay, so during the interview, I'm gonna talk about a handful of things. I'll talk about your attitude, how to really use your portfolio in the interview. Um, again, coming back to your story, um, placing your best examples. We talked about that a little bit. And then a couple other ideas here around how to ensure that all interviewers feel valued. That's an interesting topic we'll touch on. How do you dispel any doubts that the interviewer might have about you? And then how do you make it clear you really want the job, right? So this is all in the actual interview. So, uh, and what I don't have on there, which I've just taken as a uh, given is show up on time, <laughs> show up early, right? Show up a few minutes early, but okay. So bring the right attitude, right? So imagine if guys, so you've been with me for an hour here, right? You're giving up an hour of your Saturday to listen to me talk about interviewing. Imagine if this was my energy and I was talking about interviewing and yep, uh, this is really interesting and I'm really gonna hold your attention for an hour, right? Huge difference. If you're gonna be on video with someone, you're gonna to have to bring some energy and fine, okay. You might not be, you know, Energizer Bunny, right? That's okay, but what can you do? Smile, right? So even when you're just doing Zoom calls, um, you know, with friends or family, work on smiling, 
just sit there and smile while the person's talking. That is very different than, because our faces naturally are like this. How is that for the interviewer? They look at you and you're sitting there like this. It's not nice. It's not positive. It's not a happy person who they're going to want to hire, right? So little things like that. So just smiling, actually bringing some positive energy. You can even like I'm using my hands a little bit, right? That's just me engaging more with you. Although it's a virtual environment, me using my hands a little bit shows you that I'm in it, right? I'm here with you. I want to be here with you. And then be confident, right? So this is kind of weaved through uh, the interview and how you tell your story, how you talk about the examples that you're going to use, making sure that you're not devaluing yourself in the interview, right? So really being mindful of, are you bringing you know, a positive attitude into the interview? Because this is all they know of you is what you give them in those 30 minutes, right? So you know, be somebody that they're going to want to spend a lot of time on Zoom with. <laughs> Um, okay, next. So let's go back to that portfolio, right? Because now we're in the interview. We've, we've built this thing, hopefully, or at least a, you know, a short version of it. Now we're in the interview. How do we actually use it? So like I said, if you have the email address for the interviewer, I would send it to that person the, the day before the interview. And I would just say, you know, um, John, um, sending this uh, in advance of our interview tomorrow, really looking forward to chatting with you, whatever you want to say, something brief, right? And you're going to attach it as a PDF. And um, again, I'd probably limit it to six or seven pages. I wouldn't go crazy. Um, if you send a 12 page document, that's going to put them off. So just be mindful of that. Um, let's say that you don't have the email address of the person you're interviewing what, with, or let's say, you know, it's a panel and, um, you, you know, you jump on and there are a couple people on there, um, and you haven't for whatever reason, been able to send it to them beforehand. I would start the interview off and I would say, do you mind, um, if I send you guys a quick email, I've actually prepared something for the interview I'd love to share with you. So what does that do by doing that? Well, you can send them the document. They'll give you their email address to send it to them real quick. That shows some leadership, right? That shows some confidence. That shows, you know, you being able to actually lead a small group, right? And sending them that document, it's going to impress them. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say no, which would be kind of weird. But if they say no, um, then you could ask if that could be something that you could send to them afterwards. I doubt that's going to happen though. Okay, so assuming that they have this because they've received it the night before or right as the interview is starting, let them know what this is. Let them know that you've prepared a short portfolio, you know, telling them a bit more about your experience beyond just your resume. Tell them what's in there, you know, let them know you've created a suitability map that kind of aligns your experience with what they're looking for in the job. Let them know you've created a 30, 60, 90 day plan. Also let them know that, you know, perhaps there's a letter of recommendation in there. Right, so just give them a quick overview, you know, 10 or 20 seconds of what you prepared for them. And then as you're actually being interviewed, this is a great time to use the portfolio. So let's say that you're, at, you're asked a question and you know, because you've planned your strongest answers and you know that you have a work sample in your portfolio that aligns with one of those answers you're going to use. And you get asked the question and you know that you're going to tell that story about when you worked at Office Max, right? And you can say to them, actually, if you turn to page four in the PDF, I'm actually going to talk about the example that you see there. Again, on another level, right, of a candidate applying for a job, right, and kind of pulling pieces together that set you apart versus the person who's just kind of sitting there kind of passively responding and, come and giving answers to questions as they're fired at them. Very different candidate. Aaron? Alicia. Um, you may have already answered this, but this uh, goes along with what you're saying. Uh, if you have multiple rounds of interviews for a position, when is it appropriate to include the portfolio? Yeah, great question. So I wouldn't use it for a phone screening with a recruiter. Okay. Um, I would definitely, when we get, when you get into being interviewed by, by the hiring manager and the, the team that you'd be working with, I would definitely use the portfolio there. Or, but you know, that's why it's important to find out who's interviewing you. And if it's just a phone screening with a recruiter, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use it there. Um, does that help? Yeah. Sorry. Can I have a follow up to that? Um, yeah. If you have, you know, you're going to have multiple rounds and if the same person's involved in multiple rounds, do you want to like save it till it's the last or panel? No, okay. no. I would. Yeah, no, it's a good question, Vita. I would, I would, I mean, hit them, hit them hard, right? Like if that's a hiring manager, I would give, and if you know that they would also be in the panel, 
um, that's going to help them advocate for you to the panel. Because before every panel interview, the hiring manager, you know, if they've they've had a one-on-one -on -one with the candidate, they already there's a pre-discussion that happens before that panel where the hiring manager briefs the panelists on where the candidates are at, and um, the hiring manager will mention it. If you've done this, you've prepared this portfolio, they will say. Uh, you know, Vita's coming in, she's coming in strong. I mean, she sent me this, so I'm going to forward it to you guys. You still are going to send the other people their own version, but yeah, that'll help them advocate for you. Great question. So hi, um, my name's Vanessa, and I kind of wanted to follow Vita's question, which is a great question. Thank you, Vita. Um, my concern is I love this idea of a portfolio, but if you are explicitly told not to prepare anything, because I did ask, is it going to be seen as she can't follow directions or we told her not to do it. So I'm ready to like do all this stuff tonight, but I'm going to have to prepare it either way. But yeah, given the explicit instructions, how do you balance yeah. showing ambition and leadership, but yeah. also staying within parameters? Yeah, great question, Vanessa. So, so you asked, should I prepare anything? And they said, no. Is that what happened? Correct. I asked them directly, oh, by the way, because they said this is going to be, they yep. framed it as a conversation, yep. which I loved. And I'm still going to prepare and do all yeah. the things. I thought that yeah. was great. But yeah. that with, you told me not to do a thing, but I did it. Yeah. So, uh, and again, you know, he, you, you have to do what's right for you here. Yeah. My, my gut tells me that that person was answering that question, believing that um, you thought that they were asking you to pretend, potentially prepare a presentation, you know, so, deliver something to them. Because oh, a lot of, okay. a lot of interviews, um, you know, they'll ask you to prepare a presentation or do research on something, right? We're getting more and more of that happening where they specifically say, I want you to present to me on this and come prepared to do that. So my instincts tell me that that's what that interviewer is responding to. Uh, um, okay, okay. Yeah, so you putting together, you know, a short PDF um, portfolio, I could only impress them. There is the odd chance that this person is a control freak um, and, it, and, and this could put them off. And honestly, Vanessa, you don't want to work for that person if exactly. that's the case. Mm -hmm. I would just say in your email to them, I would say, you know, Amanda, I know that um, you mentioned I didn't need to bring anything to the interview. Um, you know, I, I did actually put together something, uh, some additional information on me um, mm, okay. you know, that I'd love to share with you. I'm sure they'll be impressed. Again, if they're a control freak maniac, not the best place to start okay. you know what i'm saying so yeah, no, exactly but that's where that's where i believe their no you don't need to prepare anything is coming from uh okay now that clarifies it thank you so much you're welcome okay guys so um the, the portfolio is just great it's a great way for you when asked a question to you know to do more than just talk right you could you know if, if they give you that hard question of so why are you the best person for this job you know, I'm actually really glad you asked that. You know, I, I, I put together this one pager. It, it kind of maps my experience against what you're looking for, right? So it just kind of gives you tools that you can use in the actual interview, not to mention this thing. They will pass it around afterwards. You know, the people who I, I work with one-on-one, um, -on -one, I love the stories that they share with me after they make these portfolios. You know, they'll come back and they'll say, not only did I get the offer, but the interviewer said, they've never seen anything like this. And they, you know, they sent it around to everyone in the office, you know? So I, I, I'm telling you, doing a portfolio um, will help you stand out. Okay, let's go back to the story, guys. So, you know, we talked about kind of how to think about your story in the interview. And, and we talked about these bullet points here, these top five on the page, right? So you, you'll go into the interview already feeling confident and comfortable telling your story. And I would encourage you to practice it. Get on Zoom with a friend and have your friend say, you know, so tell me about yourself or your mom or somebody, right? And, and just practice talking about yourself specific to how you would tell your story for that job. There's gonna be a ton of overlap, guys. Like once you get good at telling your story, there's gonna be overlap. You'll be able to um, quickly kind of just make little tweaks based on different interviews. But I added a couple bullet points at the bottom here that I wanna talk about just while you're in the interview, right? So making sure that in addition to having a great story, you're actually combining it with positive nonverbals. So by nonverbals, I mean the things I'm doing, not just the things I'm saying, right? So that is smiling, right? That's looking at the camera, right? Um, you know, that's actually bringing some energy because if when I tell my story about me, I sound bored, 
or I'm looking over here, you know, at the neighbor's house, how am I going to hold your attention, right? And, and, you know, the other thing, the last bullet point there is just trying when you tell your story to evoke some emotion in your audience, right? So, um, you know, how do you do that? You, you actually, you know, share things that are genuine and real, right? And, and when you're telling your story, you know, if you're, if you're a, you know, a, a tech genius, right? And you are just so good at everything to do with computers. How can you tell that story in a way that's going to actually connect with your audience and evoke some emotion? Well, what about if you said something like, you know, when I was little, I would take apart my, I had this little, this little kid computer thing. And I would take that thing apart because I was just so determined to try to understand how that thing works. It was no surprise that I ended up in, in college studying computer science. That's just a little example of how you can invoke some emotion in your audience, right? So bringing some personality to your story, right? Thinking about any point in the journey that you could in inject something. So, you know, when I was in college, I played soccer and, you know, I was the one, you know, who literally was always first to the ball. That's kind of how I'm known professionally. I'm, I'm the one who's kind of first to the project. I, you know, I'm really determined to get work done, whatever, right? Like just, Anything that you can say that's true, and neither of those stories about me are true. I just, you know, just made them up. But um, anything you can say that that shows a little bit more of your personality, and um, you know, just can tell a story that that brings somebody in and evokes some emotion in them is a great thing to do when you tell your story. Okay, Marin, I'm sorry yeah. to interject. Oh but yeah, please. Someone asked about what about phone call interviews. Yeah. How what, do what you about? let? How do you let? Um, well, it says you don't get the option to nod and smile. So how should you make sure the interviewer knows you're engaged? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, so to me, that's the energy in your voice. So, you know, close your eyes for a second and, and listen to my voice and listen to the energy that's in my, in my voice. Okay. Keep your eyes closed and now listen to the energy that's in my voice and see how excited you are to listen to me all day. Right. That's a very different person. I'm the same person. Right, but you know, when I actually bring you some energy in my voice, you're gonna be way more engaged than when I am monotonous, right? So just being aware of that. And, and you know, the other thing I'd say is let your passion come through. Uh, you know, if there's something that you're really passionate about, like let those feelings come out in the interview. That's infectious, you know? like. We all have, and I see it, you know, when I work with my students, when they start talking about things that they love, uh, their faces light up or their voice lights up, you know, so let that happen for you, you know, and that will come across whether it's on the phone or on a video call. Okay, so back to, um, back to those examples, right? So you've planned the, let's say, five to seven stories that you know, if you place those in the interview, you know your odds of getting to the next step or getting the offer are really high, right? So I wanna just talk a little bit more about that for a second before I go on. So you're probably sitting there going, but Marin, how do I know what they're gonna ask me? How do I, like, how are these stories gonna fit? If you've got five to seven stories that are, are diverse stories, right? Really talking about the breadth of experience that you have, I promise you, you will be able to fit them. It's like a puzzle. It's like this slide. It's like a puzzle. You're gonna fit the pieces in where they make sense. Sure, one of the questions or two of the questions they ask you may be oddballs, right? Like the ten, how many tennis balls fit in the swimming pool, right? So you're gonna, you're gonna have to roll with it when you, know, you get something and it is a little bit different. But if the majority of your answers are stories that you know sell you really well for that job, you're gonna set yourself up to do really well in the interview. And then the second bullet point here, I wanna talk about for a minute. So this is, this is specific to how people answer questions, not what they say, but how they structure their answers. So most people, when asked a question, they will simply give the answer. So, you know, tell me about a time when you, um, you know, managed a project and there was a lot of tension on the team, right? So most people will answer that and they'll say, yeah, you know, there was a time when I was working at IBM um, and the project was, you know, creating this software and, oh my gosh, the team didn't get along, blah, 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 right? So most people will dive right into a specific example. What I suggest you do is you actually stretch it out a little bit. So 
I suggest you use this framework of what I call philosophy, situation, result. That actually helps you give a complete answer. So what's philosophy, right? So philosophy is talking generally about how you handle those sorts of situations, right? So what was my question? My question was something about, uh, tell me about a time when you worked with a team and there was a lot of conflict, right? So, you know, in any work situation, when you put together a bunch of people from, you know, different backgrounds with, you know, different areas of expertise, there's going to be conflict. That's natural. You know, for me, it's about how do you best navigate conflict, right? So that's a little bit of philosophy. It's just kind of letting you inside my head how I see those sorts of situations. So then I could go into a specific example of IBM. And even more important than the philosophy part is the result part. So most people forget to actually talk about what happened. <laughs> and this is where it actually really matters that you've pre-planned your strongest stories because you could go down a path that you don't necessarily want to go down, right? If you, if you are sharing an example and the result isn't good, you don't really want to be talking about that one, right? But if you've actually really thought through the, the stories from your experience that, that are strong and that there's a great result and there's you know, some great learning that you can share, that's where the magic happens in an interview, right? When you give a complete answer like this. And then anything else that you get to share in the interview beyond kind of hopefully getting in those strongest stories, that's a bonus, right? And, and you know, that's gonna happen. There's gonna be just some, some extra that happens in any interview, but I would view that as a bonus, not as your entire approach to the interview, which is what most people do. Okay, a couple more points here for during the interview. So this one, um, so this is kind of the psychology of interviewing here, right? So ensure that all interviewers feel valued. So we're, get, we're getting kind of Jedi, but um, for some of you, you know, who are more advanced in your careers, um, this is actually really important. So one simple one, so eye contact, right? So what I always do, and I don't know if you guys did this today, but what I always do when I'm gonna start a video call is I move the boxes, I move all your faces, and I put you up on the top of my screen right below my camera. So it actually looks like I'm, I'm looking at you. If, I, if you were still down there on the right side of my screen, this is what you would see. You would see my eyes looking at the right side of the screen. That's weird, right? But I moved you up to the top. So eye contact, even on video calls, is actually really important. So set yourself up for success and move the boxes to where your camera is. Another thing that is important to do in an interview situation is actually address the person by name. You know, Alicia, it's, it's great to see you today. Thanks for having me, right? And, and if there are multiple interviewers and you have, you know, you have, you're responding to them, you know, oh, Vita, thanks for the question, right? So then Vita knows I'm actually speaking directly to her and using people's names in an interview situation makes them feel included, right? That makes them feel seen. And we all want that, no matter, you know, how senior we are, what, you know, if it's the big, big boss, they, everybody has these same kind of psychological needs. And then the last one, um, I talked about questions before, right? And I said, my favorite question is um, asking the interviewer, what's the most important thing that they're looking for in who they hire? So if it's a group situation with, you know, a panel interview, multiple people interviewing you, this question is so good because this question allows each person who is on the interview panel to feel like their vote really matters. Because sometimes in interviews, what happens when it's a panel is there's a lead interviewer, right? And that person is gonna ask most of the questions and then the other people will be allowed to ask one or two. And they actually, they all have strong opinions usually if they're on an interview panel, they have, they really want to have a say in who gets hired. So if you ask each person on the panel, if you say, you know, actually I have, a, my last question actually is, is something I'd like, lo love to hear from each of you. You know, what's the number one thing that you're looking for in who you hire? You know, John, if you want to start, uh, Vanessa, then we'll go to you and Callie, then we'll go to you. Um, that is so good, you guys, because then each person has the chance to speak up, share what really matters to them. If they say something and you've clearly demonstrated that you bring that as a skill, they're, they are validating you to the group, right? Which is super amazing. If they say something and it isn't a skill that you've demonstrated, you now know they've been sitting there saying, mm, I don't think she's going to cut it because she doesn't have this. That's your chance, right? That's your chance to actually speak up and um, share, uh, share that thing that that person says they're looking for, right? So that kind of speaks to my next, my next slide um, 
which is dispel any doubts, right? So that's where that, this is where that closing question actually becomes really important because the two things you definitely don't want to have happen in your next interview. You don't want to walk out of the interview and not have shared those stories, the ones that are actually going to get you hired. And you don't want to walk out of the interview with one of the interviewers having this big doubt about you that you never even got to speak to. And how are you going to find out if that's a doubt or not? How are you going to find out if there's an objection to you, right? By asking that question of what's the number one thing you're looking for. I guarantee you, if they are, if they, if there's something that's big and you, they think you don't have it, they're going to say, you know, honestly, we really were looking with some, for somebody who had more experience managing a large team or, you know, I mean, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned that. I didn't get to talk about my experience at Walmart. I actually was responsible for a team of 25 people. I can't believe I didn't mention that. Could I tell you a little bit more about that, right? That becomes really important. And then the other thing, guys, during the interview, like make it clear you want the job, right? The goal here with your, your next interview is to get the offer. And, and so being super serious and um, acting super cool, um, tell them that you want the job, right? At the end of the interview, thank them for their time and say, you know, Alicia, it's been so great chatting with you. And I, I just, I want to be honest with you, you know, I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation. I really think that, um, you know, I, I have what you're looking for and the culture of the team would be a great fit. Um, I just want to make it clear, I, 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 I'm really interested in the position. Some version of that that feels authentic to you, like let them know you want the job, um, you know, and, and be positive about it. It's weird as an interviewer when you end an interview and the person kind of seems disinterested, <laughs> you know? Um, so leave them with some confidence that, that you want it. Okay, before we go, I just have a couple more slides. Um, before we go into the after the interview, is there anything you guys want to ask about? Well, there was one question that came through that we didn't get to ask earlier. Uh, would it be frowned upon to upload your portfolio in the chat for those that you didn't have an advance notice of? Oh, no, that's a great idea. Totally, love that. Okay. I should write that down. I've got a question real quick, if I can. Yeah. Um, what's your advice on how to best get your background across if you haven't started that career yet? Like if your background is in a different industry, um, how to best kind of highlight the future and where you're going versus, I feel like I'm getting stuck in um, things that, yeah, I've done in the past versus yeah. where I want to be. I mean, I think you're going to have to talk about related skills, right? Um, whether it's an education that has prepared you to do this work or, um, you know, skills that you used in past positions. Like, let's say you work in real estate and you want to go work in tech, right? You know, manage, there are, there are going to be things that are transferable, right? So whether it's managing projects or working in a, you know, a team environment, right? So I would focus less on talking about the industry or the specific job and talk more about the skills. Does that, does that help? Yeah. I mean, I know it's, I know it's tough for career changers. It's, it's, it's tough because you're, you're, you're trying to talk more about where you're going than where you've been, but there is a, don't discount where you've been. There is a lot that you've done that actually will help you. It's just talking about it more, I think, skill-based um, rather than, you know, I've worked in real estate for 10 years. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk just, I got a couple slides here. I'm gonna let you guys get on with your Saturday evening plans. Um, this is after the interview, right? So, oh my gosh, the interview ended. You can breathe <laughs> now. And now what do you do, right? How do we handle this? So just uh, three things I wanna talk about. I wanna talk about kind of thank yous and the follow-up. And then what do, what do you do if you do get the offer? Hooray. What do you do if you don't get the offer? Okay. So thank yous and follow-up. So this is a rule of mine, whether we're talking about interviewing or anything. Um, if you're working to advance your career, you should be responding to things within 24 hours max, right? So if you have an interview, you should be sending a thank you email um, by the end of the day or at latest within a kind of a 24 hour cycle. Because if it's gonna take you longer than that, that's just a bad sign, right? If two or three days later, you're sending your thank you note. Again, how you conduct yourself in the interview is the best indicator of how you're gonna conduct yourself if they hire you. So send the right message right there. Uh, email is best. Don't try to get their address or anything weird like that. Um, 
if something came up in the interview that feels like something you should follow up on, right? So if they asked for additional information on something and you said that you would send it to them, you know, or if there was a topic that came up in the interview uh, and, you know, you found an interesting article on it as a follow up, that could be nice to include in your thank you, just a link to something. And then I would say um, in your follow up, um, it's okay to check in with them if it's been, you know, I would say a week and a half to two weeks since you, um, since you've heard anything. And if they told you that, you know, they'd hear from, you'd probably hear from them in a, in a week or so, it's fine to send a polite note just to checking in to see where they're at in the process, okay? You don't have to feel helpless and like you're just waiting forever. And then, okay, these two, this, this slide's really important, guys. Um, I mean, this is great if you get the offer, but what do you do, right? How do you handle that? This is like, this is the party, but let's not, you know, let's not throw the cake out the window. Like, let's make sure, you know, the cake is as delicious and as big as it can be. So know your worth, right? So hopefully you've done your research on what this job should pay and you know what you were making before. So really kind of, you know, understand what your worth is. When they call you or email you and say, you know, it, Callie, it's you. We've decided, you know, we want to offer you the job. Well, that's awesome. Be grateful and excited when they say that to you, but don't jump right away and say, I accept. Yes, I'm in. Ask them to send you, say thank you and say, that's really fantastic. Can you email me the offer? You need to see the details of the offer is, is what I'm saying here. Because there, there's a lot that goes into a job offer, right? There's, you know, what they're going to pay you. Are there any bonuses? What's the vacation? Are they covering any expenses? Is there relocation? What is there, right? There are lots of details in a job offer. And so one of the biggest mistakes people make is they say yes without seeing the details. And then the other big mistake that they make is once they do see it, um, they just say yes. Uh, they don't negotiate anything. And then I'll add a third mistake, which is when people negotiate, they negotiate everything at once. Right. So let's say I get a job offer and I'm not happy with the title. I'm not happy with the money. I'm not happy with, um, you know, the fact that they're not offering to cover any of my expenses. Right. Well, what's what of those things matters most to me? It's going to be different for everybody. But, you know, for me, I'm probably going to say the money. The money probably matters most. So I'm not going to email them and say, you know, Jacob, thanks for the offer. Um, I, you know, these are kind of the things I was hoping we could talk more about. No, I'm going to email them. I'm going to say thanks for the offer. I was hoping we could talk a little bit more about, uh, about salary. Um, you know, based on my research, it looks like, you know, typical roles um, at this level would be paying this much. Um, you know, are, are you negotiable? I wouldn't go back to them with a number. I would start by asking them if they're negotiable, right? And my point here is start negotiating the most important thing first, right? So finish that discussion and then Get that as far as you can and then negotiate the other things. If you give them a list of things that you want to negotiate, they'll give you something. They'll give you the thing that's least valuable and they'll feel good about how that negotiation went. Okay. So um, this is a big one. And people, yeah, people just don't advocate for themselves enough because uh, they, they, you know, they're nervous and they've been waiting so long to get an offer. And then, you know, they kind of end up lowballing themselves. And, you know, the thing we all know is once you're in, it's really hard to move up. It's really hard to get more money. You know, the norm is 3% raises. So I encourage you to, to like do some negotiating on the way in. They're not all of a sudden gonna change their mind about you because you have some negotiation skills. Frankly, it's probably gonna impress them as long as you're polite and professional about it and excited, you know, okay? Um, and then what if you don't get the offer? You know, that sucks, right? We've all been there, um, but still be very gracious. Be grateful that, you know, they considered you. Definitely ask them for feedback uh, if they're willing to give it. Um, if it went really well and they told you that it was down to you and one other person, that means they really liked you, right? And perhaps that person they hired was internal and perhaps you never really had a chance anyway, right? Ask them about any future openings that they, they, they might see coming in the company. There's so many times that I've worked with people who they, you know, they were the, the second place and that next time an opening came out around, they got scooped up because the interviewer loved them, right? Stay in touch. So if there's an interviewer and you end up with having a few interviews with them and it really just was a great vibe and for whatever reason they had to go with a different candidate, very often it's because it's an internal candidate, stay in touch with them, shoot them a note, you know, a month after the fact, after you've been told you don't get the offer, just to say, you know, hey, just wanted to reach out. I'm, I'm still on the market, you know, still super interested in working at your company. Um, you know, 
just wanted to find out if you see any openings coming, right? I mean, if you were that close, you impressed them, you know, don't be shy and don't kind of put your tail between your legs and feel like you failed, okay? Um, how are we doing? I think, I think we've kind of done it, Alicia. We've kind of gone through. <laughs> it feels like, yay. <laughs> I have, I think I just have maybe two more slides, but it feels like we did it. We talked about the before, the during and the after. We've armed you guys with, I think, what feels to me like a lot of information. I'm a little exhausted. Uh, I've talked so much. <laughs> um, if you guys, we'll do questions, but you know, I want to just, I want to plant this seed with you, this. I want to go back to this, which is, Yes, the interview is really important, but I also want to challenge you to think about these steps before the interview. Um, if you want more information on that, um, connect with me on LinkedIn. I post lots of good stuff on LinkedIn. There's my LinkedIn address. Um, I post lots of good stuff on Instagram, lots of funny stuff on Instagram. Um, and then my blog on madetohire.com is full of career advice. My book, um, and my book is kind of, you know, it's the A to Z of, of of that five-step process. So we dove into one part of it. I do a lot, um, a lot in the book on all the other pieces too. Alicia, what, what else can I do? How was this? That was fantastic. Thank you. I think I speak for us all when I say thank you so much. And we have so much great information uh, to work with. I'm we really so appreciate glad. it. Oh, I'm so glad you guys. If there are questions, I'm happy to, to answer them. And, and just so grateful to get um, I've had this time with you guys. Thank I have you. one. I have one quick question. I'm sorry that I couldn't get my camera to work. This is Michael Contreras, yeah. and uh, this really doesn't have to do with interviewing, but I I really uh, respect your expertise, and I'm wondering how do you get around age discrimination prior to an interview? In other words, how do you get yeah. the interview, yeah. you know, with with not setting dates on your experience and your totally. jobs and yeah. your education? Yeah, great question, Michael. Thanks for that. So I would say um, a couple things, a couple tricks um, there. So some people in their resume, you know, at the top, they've got like a, a blurb that kind of describes their background, right? So you're definitely not going to want to put their 35 years of experience in sales and marketing, right? So I would say if it's more than 20, I would say 20 plus would be the language I would use. Um, so that's one, one thing that I noticed some people do that's an instant kind of, you know, age um, challenge. The other thing is I would take the degrees off, uh, the, not the degrees, the dates off your degrees, right? Have your degrees on your resume, but you don't have to put the dates, the years on there. Um, the other thing I would do is I would consider if you've had a long career, let's say you've had a 30 year career, um, I would consider not putting, you know, the first 10 years of your career on there. Um, if your career is so extensive and you've had so many different positions, um, perhaps, you know, the last 20 years is plenty um, for your resume. Those are a couple, um, a couple things. You, you should put dates on your resume, but you don't, you know, you get to choose. You don't have to put your entire career history on there. And that's kind of one of the things I talk a lot about with my clients is, um, you get to choose what you put on there. Um, and I, I definitely encourage you, this is a whole other workshop, but I encourage you to get, it, get your resume down to one page. Thank you so much for that. I really appreciate your input. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. All right, you guys, it sounds like you all want to start your Saturday night. So uh, thank you so much for letting me um, letting me come and, and share my, my love of all this with you. And please do reach out to me, um, follow me on social, check out my blog, check out my book. Yeah, I wish you the best of luck.